thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, uh, like Kim said, we're here to talk about why antivirus sucks, and it really does suck. I've been working in IT and IT security and cybersecurity or whatever it's called nowadays for a long time, and I've seen every possible piece of malware you can imagine, or every possible I think I can imagine. And it ranges from users downloading software through to um, an email that came in through an attachment through to a piece, uh, a, a vulnerability in the system. Uh, the point is, they come in a lot of ways. Um, previously, before my current uh, venture, I used to run an email security company. We had 16 different antiviruses scanning incoming email. And guess what? Viruses still got through sometimes. Protecting your business from viruses seems impossible nowadays. It's harder than it ever has been. And unlike 10 years ago, the threat of viruses aren't just slowing down your computer. It's a real damage to your business. Back in 2003, I was working in corporate IT. Um, in, it wasn't security back then. It was just IT. And um, we had standard firewalls, email protection gateways, anti corporate antivirus software. And one day, we got a number of tickets in the help desk saying that, people were receiving suspicious attachments in their email. They were inside a zip file. So we sent a notification out, uh, a caution to everybody saying, don't open any attachments. A few hours later, uh, uh, the lady that worked at the front desk called down and said, there's a problem with it, my email. I've got this attachment, and it won't open. I keep trying to open it, and it won't open. Um, so we went down to see why this attachment wouldn't open, expecting the worst. And by the time we got down there, she was extremely upset, because there was a lot of inappropriate content shown on her machine. Now, I wish the biggest side effect of a virus today was inappropriate content and an, an upset lady on the front desk. Unfortunately, it's not. Forward to 2015, I was asked to come in and help a recovery from an insurance company in Australia that had been infected by CryptoLocker. Now, you shouldn't call me for recovery. You should call me before it happens. But in this case, I was called to help with the recovery. The company had had everything on their network encrypted, their SQL databases, their exchange databases, they're backups which are off-site connected to the same network. Every single thing was encrypted. About a week into the recovery efforts, the CEO called me, and this was a fully grown man, and he was crying because his business was destroyed. So it got me thinking, how in 10 years have we gone from somebody on the front desk being upset by inappropriate content to a fully grown man crying because his insurance company is failing over a virus that somebody opened? Now, the story didn't end bad. He did lose a lot of data. We did manage to recover a lot of data, and he carried on with his business. They're still in business today, but it could have gone a lot worse. Viruses today, malware today, doesn't just slow down your networks. It destroys businesses. It leaks content. Fast forward to 2017, and now businesses are being completely shut down. Hospitals are turning away ambulances from doors because they've got a virus that some guy wrote in North Korea or the Ukraine or wherever it may be. Malware is not only encrypting data, it's stealing data and threatening to dump it on the web if you don't pay a ransom. And then when you do pay a ransom, they dump it anyway. So we want to understand why. Why are we unable to keep up with antivirus? Why can't, why can't these virus engines keep up with the threat of malware? And to understand this, first we must understand what is malware. Well, we can all agree obvious malware, viruses, adware, ransomware, spyware, Trojan horses. Everyone can agree these are bad. But essentially what these things are is nothing more than software that is intended for bad purposes. A remote access tool that allows an attacker access to your machine, uh, such as a piece of spyware, works in the same way that TeamViewer or GoToAssist may work. The only difference is enough people have reported this to say, this is bad. So how are antiviruses trying to deal with these threats? The most common ways are things like definitions, blacklists. Every time someone reports something bad, if it's been seen enough, there's a very algorithms that why something gets added to the blacklist, it gets added to the blacklist. Heuristics, outbreak detection, behavior detection, all of these te new techniques, even new methods like AI, the problem is these fall short, and they fall short simply because it doesn't matter how smart your antivirus is, it can't tell the difference between a good piece of remote access software and a bad piece of remote access software. It's just saying it's remote access software. And they're not even trying to deal with the good pieces of remote access software. Things like GoToAssist and TeamViewer and LogMeIn and all those other tools, 
which can be used to access your network. So how do we address this issue? I mean, the antivirus engines can't keep up. Most companies have changed their antivirus three to four times in the last decade, believing that the new product is going to be better than the last product. And I guess that's the answer they have to the board. Oh, well, we fixed it now because we've got a new antivirus. It's not the solution. How can we stop this? Well, the answer is pretty simple, and I've been preaching this answer for a long time. It's called application whitelisting. The concept of whitelisting is simply to block everything that isn't explicitly allowed by your IT department. It doesn't care if it's good. It doesn't care if it's bad. It's not a judge and a jury. It's just an executioner, and it says, if it's not allowed, if it's not on our list, we block it. Now, this technology has been around for a long time. It's been used in the federal government for a long time. It's been used in large banks for a long time. Industry experts as Gartner, CIS, NIST all agree that it's, it's the way you should be protecting your infrastructure. Forrester have gone one step further and said not only is application whitelisting, uh, advocates the approach of application whitelisting, they advocate that zero trust approach across the board when it comes to cybersecurity. But it's really hard. If anyone's tried to deploy whitelisting before, it's really hard. Back in 2015, every time I spoke to a client and they said, how can we stop these threats? I used to see application whitelisting. They said, we can't afford it. We don't have the budget. We don't have the time. Well, my answer was always back then, tough. You have to make the budget. It's not a choice. You know, your kid doesn't like a vaccination. You still get it. It's not, it's not a choice. You have to do it. Yet, less than 5% of businesses are doing it. In 2015, the federal government passed new legislation on the IT Modernization Act that requires all federal government IT to implement whitelisting. The reason whitelisting is hard is for a lot of reasons. One is, how do you deploy it? Most PCs have 20 to 60,000 DLL files, executable files, script files running on them. If you have to go around 1,000 PCs, 100 PCs, 2,000 PCs to catalog all those files, that's a huge job. It's going to take a lot of people a lot of time. The other problem with it is Microsoft released 25,000 new hashes on Patch Tuesday last month. So if you're implementing whitelisting in, in a proper manner, you have to go and add those 25,000 new hashes to your database. Again, it's another big problem. Uh, approvals are too slow. The CEO called down. He wants to run WebEx. You say, well, sorry, it's going to take me two hours. It's not going to cut it. And installing two, new software is always too difficult because the process of cataloging that software is tedious. Now, it doesn't have to be easy. So in 2015, it was a busy year for viruses. It was a busy year for me. And we decided that we needed to do something about whitelisting. We decided that whitelisting was the only logical choice because there is no way you can accurately detect what is good and bad. It's not possible. So we decided application whitelisting had to be easy. So we built a product that deals with all of the issues in whitelisting, a product that can be deployed in minutes, automatically profiles everything on your machines, catalogs your applications, has a 24-hour sock behind it to make sure that when Microsoft releases new updates, Office releases new updates, Google Chrome, Adobe, that those whitelists are updated so you can just say that's running. And it's really, really easy to use. Now, I'm, I'm not going to focus too much on what we do, because I'm here to talk about the problems and how we can solve them. But I did want to actually demonstrate very, very quickly in a two-minute video on how whitelisting can be deployed. Here's a two-minute video, and I accept it is oversimplified to an extent uh, on how whitelisting, how you can deploy whitelisting in two minutes. Sign up for a free trial at ThreatLocker.com. Once you have received your credentials, log in to the ThreatLocker portal, select the computer's group page, and select the download link next to a computer group. A 2 megabyte MSI will be downloaded. The MSI can be installed with a single click in less than 30 seconds, deployed using group policy or any kind of software deployment tool. Once the computers have been installed, they will automatically be displayed on the computer's page. The devices will immediately begin auditing all applications, libraries, and scripts that are executed in the ThreatLocker application audit. ThreatLocker will begin to profile applications that are running or found on your devices and automatically build policies by matching our built-in application definitions or creating custom application definitions on the fly. Review the applications in the list, select any applications you wish to block, and select the Deny button. Once you are happy with the application list, edit the default policy to deny any unauthorized software. Within 60 seconds, all unauthorized software, including malware, will be blocked. 
regardless to whether it was opened by a user, embedded in a document, or executed using an exploit. When an untrusted application is blocked, the user will be presented with a simple method of requesting permission. The administrator can approve or deny the request in a single click. Once approved, the user will be able to open the application within 60 seconds. When installing more complex applications, you can make use of Threat Locker installation mode, which automatically tracks changes made during an installation and adds the necessary hashes and certificates to the application whitelist. Once the installation is complete, select Finish. A policy will automatically be created to permit the new application. Point is, we managed to demonstrate how to deploy whitelisting in two minutes. Whether you want to use simple whitelisting or difficult whitelisting, whitelisting absolutely should be a defense in your corporate IT strategy. If it's not, at some point, you will get hit by a piece of malware that will cause massive damage. We've demonstrated this on 15 different antiviruses by writing a small piece of malware that copies everything from your file server and dumps it to a remote host. 15 different antiviruses weren't able to detect that malware because it wasn't known. That malware took two hours to write. So when you're looking for an application whitelisting solution, there are some important things that you should look for. One is, does your application whitelisting solution run at the kernel? It's not good enough just to protect you from users. While users are the biggest threat and they're most likely going to open something that's going to cause a problem, WannaCry executed from the kernel. It used an exploit and ran at the kernel level. So any, anything you're running should run at the kernel level and not at the user level. Does it give granular controls of what should run. It's not good enough to say this is allowed to run. You should limit what can run based on the individual user. It might be okay for a user to run PowerShell if they're an administrator, but the average user doesn't need to run PowerShell and doesn't need to run all of the admin components built into Windows. Does it whitelist by more of than path or folder? Just saying it's in this folder, so it must be safe, or it's this file name, so it must be safe, is not good enough. Viruses are getting smarter. They're renaming Windows files. They're renaming notepad.exe and then swapping it out to a virus. It's really, really important not to just do it by path. And does it apply to scripts and browser extensions, non-executables uh, as well? Now, one of the questions I get asked, well, what about threats that live off the land? Fileless malware, sometimes it's referred to. Antiviruses are really struggling with this because just like application whitelisting, it's not actually a file that's opening, so we don't have anything to block. It's running something inside Windows, like PowerShell, or like an embedded tool, and it's actually running from the operating system. Can things like whitelisting help with this? Well, the answer is yes, but it's not complete. Uh, antivirus is basically impossible to detect it. The way you handle these threats isn't through necessarily just whitelisting or through blacklisting. Um, it's also through things like ring fencing. If you're using an application whitelisting solution, don't allow something just because it's good. Don't allow PowerShell just because it's good if you don't need it. Don't allow executables that are part of Windows, registry editor, if the user doesn't need it. Only allow what is needed to perform the jog function. That reduces your surface area of attack massively. And applications that you do allow, you should also allow based on the, the process that's starting it. So it's not okay to say, well, you can run PowerShell from anything. You say, well, how do you run PowerShell? How do you interact with it? If you run it from explorer.exe, allow it to run from explorer.exe. Don't allow Word to open PowerShell. Why does Word need to open PowerShell? And when you are allowing applications, use technologies like ring fencing. Ring fencing is a technology that allows you to dictate what an application and a process can access once it's running. For example, Adobe Reader doesn't need to be able to write to your file server. It doesn't need to be able to write to Word documents. So why can it? If that process is exploited by an attacker through a bug, an unpatched version, it now has full access to your network. We blindly allow applications that we run to access everything on our system. So don't allow applications to access everything. If it's Adobe Reader, only allow it to access PDF files or any other types of files it needs. 
If it's office, give it the relevant access. The same applies to spinning up other programs. Don't allow them to spin up other programs. So this is something that comes up a lot. Eternal Blue. I don't know how many people here are familiar with the Eternal Blue exploit. So the NSA allegedly created this exploit five years before Edward Snowden told the world about it. And what this exploit allowed you to do was point at any IP address of a machine that didn't have a firewall on and get full admin privileges to the machine. WannaCry exploited it in 2017. It was one of the most vicious viruses we've seen over the last few years. And the reason it was so effective was because not only was it exploiting user machines, but because there was file servers on the network and that had no personal firewalls on because they obviously needed to service files, they were exploited by this and they were able to get access to your servers and other critical infrastructure. So how does technologies like application whitelisting and ring fencing help you with things like vulnerabilities? Well, first of all, patch your machines. It's absolutely vital that your machines are patched. And just because you have the best antivirus or the best whitelisting solution in the world or the best firewall in the world, patching should be a critical part of your defense. But in the case of Eternal Blue, where there was no patch for five years, there are things you can do to reduce your surface area of attack. For example, one use case of Eternal Blue was where you were able to use an exploit, can it attach yourself to the print spoiler process, and then you could spin up Command Prompt, PowerShell, or WannaCry. Well, if you're using a good whitelisting solution, you shouldn't be able to spin up the WannaCry. But you want to be able to stop those other applications and your documents being accessed and your files being accessed. So use things like uh, the ring fencing to say, well, print spoiler, we know, needs to access our print drivers. It needs to access our print queues. It doesn't need to access command prompt, PowerShell, or any of the user's documents. People focus, businesses focus a lot on granting user level access to permissions. So if you have, for example, QuickBooks running and you have a file share because it still uses that historic method of a database that people connect to directly, you've set up the share and you've allowed users who need access to QuickBooks to access that share. If a user wishes to connect to that share, copy that share onto a USB drive or send it out in an email, they can do that. They can just type in the path of the share and explore and allow it. And companies never think about the applications. Again, I can't stress enough that every application you install on your machine has unlimited access to everything you as a user does when you run it. So you should use tools like ring fencing, like storage control, to actually say, well, not only is my storage device locked down to this, only this user, but only this application. So yes, the user can open this file, but only if they open QuickBooks, only if they do it through QuickBooks. And if, or they can access this USB drive, but only through Veeam Backup. We don't want malware or other users being able to access the uh, USB drive. Only the Veeam Backup service can. Use storage control solutions, use ring fencing solutions to make sure those applications only have access to what they need. We give applications far too much trust. Yeah. I'll summarize, and um, antivirus sucks. It's not doing a good job. Most corporations have changed their antivirus three to four times in the last decade, and they keep doing it hoping the next one's better. And they go back up to their board and say, we're okay now because we got a better antivirus. It's not doing the job. Don't add, change your antivirus, add layers such as application whitelisting, firewalls, storage control, and ring fencing to your antivirus. There's no point in dotting from one antivirus to the other. I appreciate everyone's time, and thank you very much.